bring the lights down a little bit? Where are they? I don't know where they are. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Oh, I've been instructed I need to stand in front of the microphone. Otherwise, we don't record, which is so hard for me because I'm a pacer. And I'd like to be up talking to everybody. Um, but I'll do my best. Oh, I don't know. Is it on? <laughs> is it on? OK. Um, otherwise, I'll be projecting very loudly if I move away, right? Um, hello, my name is Kimberly Alexander. And thank you, uh, John, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, we know that this uh, is not a new market topic, so um, uh, may not be uh, as well attended as uh, a number of other lectures. but. It's, we sort of, uh, Dane and I wanted to talk about the way we sort of put together some of our projects and thought you might be interested. So I, before um, really getting underway, I wanted to thank um, many, there's so many people who've been involved in this project. I was just telling Professor Candy, uh, who is uh, one of my readers, years and years ago, back at, at Boston University, that I've been working on this project, it's embarrassing to say, for almost 30 years. Um, but, and so you can imagine in the time that I've been working on it, uh, there have been just countless individuals involved, many of whom are no longer with us. Um, one of the first people to get me started on this was John Page, uh, who I'm showing you here, who was the state archivist um, at the New Hampshire Historical for many years and a Haverhill resident, and first um, introduced me to a number of important primary source documents. And so I always think of John whenever with uh, wonderful happy memories when I'm working on this project. I just want to thank uh, James and uh, Garvin and D.B. Garvin, um, my father Jim Alexander, Tom Stalker, Nancy Myers, who heads up the librarian in ha uh, is the librarian in Haverhill, and I'm showing you the wonderful room that we get to work in uh, when we're um, up in Haverhill doing our research. Um, Christine Mistretta, who uh, we found late in the project, or I should say she found us, um, because she had letters from one of our main characters, Myra Montgomery, that kept coming her way. And she is from Haverhill, Massachusetts, and was bitterly disappointed to find out that they were from a woman in Haverhill, New Hampshire, until she did a search and we found each other. And she has continued to find at antique stores and flea markets uh, earlier letters by Myra. So that, you know, it's one of those things, if I'd actually written this in a decent amount of time, I wouldn't have known all of these things, right? So, uh, so Christine Mastretta. Uh, and Erica Linderman, and I always want to thank the New Market Historical Society for being just such a welcome, a welcoming place. I'm on the board, I'm the um, uh, textile curator, and it's, I've worked on many, many boards, and I have to say that it's just a wonderful sense of camaraderie and uh, devotion to the history of this town, and I love being part of that. Um, that being said, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Dane Morrison uh, to talk about sort of the framework for the research. Um, as I said, I've been working on this for about 30 years. About five years ago, I said to Dane, I don't know if I'm ever gonna get this done. What do you think? You wanna help me with this? So that maybe we can finish this project before we're both six feet under. So he graciously agreed. Um, but this is the first time we've done it, this uh, sort of talk together. So there was no fighting, no biting. So we'll see how things go. So far. <laughs> I would like to add uh, my thanks to your coming out. Welcome uh, tonight. I was telling a group of incoming history students this morning um, that doing early American history for me, doing this kind of project for me, has become rather complicated and a little disappointing. Um, because when I first started early American history, it was pretty much all about 
old white guys. And now I'm an old white guy. And we are talking about other people. And some of those people who I want to bring into this story are the original people, the Abenaki people of, um, of New Hampshire, of northern New Hampshire. So we're, we are, or Haverhill, I should say, is in the homelands of the Abenaki. We're actually in the homelands of the Penacook. And what? And, um, who have, and so they have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this land. Um, we want to recognize that connection. And we also want to bring them into this story. Jump around a little bit here. So, <clears throat> One of the things that we always try to do in our stories, in our writing, is develop a sense of place. And places have stories. Um, I need to find my notes here. We're always interested in that, that wonderful phrase um, of, Things happened here that matter to me, to my families, to my neighbors, and so on. Place, the idea of place, carries personal connections and historic connections. And so we're tr what we want to do in this project on Haverhill, New Hampshire, is to get a sense of what it was like to live there, what it was like to be there. And we want to do that for each of the groups who came through and called Haverhill home. So we want to get a sense of what was it like for the Abenaki people to live in this place? What did this place, which they didn't call Haverhill, but what did this place mean to them? And then to the founding generation of the 1750s and 1760s, what did this place mean to them? And then we really pick up our story in the 1790s with the Montgomery family. And we want to get a sense, what did Haverhill mean to the, the patriarch, John Montgomery? What did it mean to his eldest daughter, Myra, what did it mean to the workers who were in his mill, in his store, and so on? What did it mean to the farmhands earning maybe eight, nine dollars a month? What did this place signify? What did it mean? What did it symbolize to them? And so we're building on work we've already done in trying to create stories about place. We want to know <clears throat> our three starting questions, our fun questions. Who actually writes the stories? Whose memories, whose recollections have been collected? Whose have been erased from the grand narrative? Who benefits from the writing of these stories? That tells us a lot about why some stories have been remembered and why some stories have been forgotten, and of course, who is missing from these stories. So I'm just going to do, hmm? she wants me to move along quickly. I cannot be controlled or contained. So how, so I should ask actually, how many of you do history? We all love to read history. How many of us do history? So I see one, two, three, you of course, three, wonderful. Um, I don't want this to be a lecture from so-called experts about how history should be done. There is no one 
best way. And there's no one right way to do history. If you're doing history and you're asking questions, if you're not just bloviating and, and, and giving answers, if you're asking questions, you're doing history right. And I would, I, I really want to encourage all of you to think about doing history. And our history is one of the most fun kinds. It's what's called local history. Now, I look over this audience, and I see you're all way too young to remember the 1970s. But in the 1970s, there was a new kind of history being done called local history or town history. And uh, historians began to focus on one town, such as Philip Grevin, looking at Andover. You'll remember this. And, and uh, Kenneth Lockridge, looking just at the town of Dedham, and so on. We're, we're kind of reprising that kind of history, looking at one town over time. And this is that northern New England town of Haverhill. So how? do we do this kind of history? So we start with a sense of place through maps. And as with place, so with maps, a map would mean different things to different people or different groups of people. And so you can see that, um, that to the Abenaki or Penacook people, early maps had different meanings from the people who sought to, and I'm going to use their phrase, to carve order out of the wilderness. This map would make, make no sense to the original people of northern New England. It would make no sense to the Abenaki. This is the kind of map from the 1790s that is meant to impose order, a certain kind of order, a certain political order. This is a map that speaks from and speaks to power, the power of the English to conquer the wilderness, again, their term, and to, 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 to impose their farms on a wilderness. There's a tension in this map that we can't see without really bringing out several sets of stories. There's a tension between the native peoples, the indigenous peoples, and the English settlers. This is, they call it Grafton County. Um, it was known as Coos, C-O-O-S, Coos country. Uh, the uh, branch of the Abenaki who lived there were, were called the Coos. And um, they inhabit, inhabited roughly this area, uh, Newberry, Vermont, Haverhill, New Hampshire. I love this map because this gives us a clearer sense of what Haverhill meant to both groups. This is a map that really highlights the environment, the ecology of this place. And what made this place attractive, what made Haverhill a place that you would want to be for both groups was the rivers and the river valleys. They, pers they made movement possible movement of people, movement of goods, but they also watered, uh, the Connecticut River in particular, watered uh, the fields that made farms possible. And you get a sense of how rich this area was by looking at its rivers. Every major village, every major town is situated along a river. Okay. You need, you know, for, for a, a place to be productive, it's not just, 
important that you have a river to water the fields. It's important to be able to move goods and move people up and down. And the Connecticut River goes right down to the Atlantic Ocean. So this is a very important waterway. And it tells you why the early governors in the 1750s really wanted to move beyond Concord, what they called um, Rumsford back then, why they wanted to move way up north into Indian country. So for the native peoples, They had been here for maybe 10,000 years. And this is why. This was a place where they could grow the three sisters. The, the, the basic, uh, they were hunter-gatherers, but they were farmers. And despite what, how the English described them, they were farmers. And here, the three sisters would flourish. What were the three sisters, anyone? Ma maize, what, what we call corn, they called maize. And you would create a little hillock. You'd create a little hillock. And you would plant pumpkin seeds and corn seeds and beans. And the corn would sprout up. But the base, you know, corn stalks go pretty high. And so it, the pumpkins and squash would provide stability for the base of the corn stalk. And the bean stalks would climb up the corn. Um, wonderful nutrition supplemented by the fish of the rivers and the shellfish of the rivers. And so this was koas for the Native Americans. Uh, well-watered plains at the river's edge and then rising up to hills and mountains. Um, just a beautiful, gentle uh, area where they, they, they could flourish. For the English, this was the Garden of New England, they called it. This was a place way up, way past Concord, way past Fort Number 4, this is a place that aroused the envy and desire of the English. So the way Haverhill starts out is in the 1650s. And, and uh, historians like uh, Powell and, uh, and Belknap in the secondary sources tell us um, not until 1760 do you find the first settlement in this part of New Hampshire. In the 1750s, the, the governors think long and hard about um, occupation. They think about spreading, uh, not New Hampshire, because this was thought to be part of Massachusetts. So Ma the, the, the New Hampshire governors are thinking about importing immigrants and bring them up to northern New Hampshire from Massachusetts. Um, tiny little problem with the timing. This was the beginning of the French and Indian Wars. So for the English, early Haverhill, early Newberry, Vermont, are going to be a frontier outpost. Okay, And I'm going to turn things over to my better half now to bring us up to the 1790s, which is the period we really want to look at. So I turn things over to you. Thank you. Do you want your coffee? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Dane, I think, has set a nicer sort of framework for the, the landscape. And I'm going to focus on Haverhill as told through um, written materials and material culture. So I'm looking at primarily three primary sources. Um, the survival of a 1793 day book from General John Montgomery Store, a Georgian house which was built for the Montgomery family in 17, about 1790, 
and a young woman's letters, Myra Montgomery, uh, who, uh, had, which provide me with an opportunity for these many years to delve into the daily lives of the inhabitants of this New northern New Hampshire town in the early years of the Young Republic. Now, General John Montgomery is per fits perfectly into the narrative as Dane has laid it out. Um, General Montgomery, John Montgomery, is, um, comes up from Londonderry, New Hampshire. And he's of a Scottish, uh, Scots-Irish ancestry. And he comes up, he's listed in the very first records as a trader. And um, he buys land on the Oliverian Brook. It wasn't even big enough to be considered a river. But it was the Oliverian Brook. He doesn't buy land to build a house, he buys land to build a factory, to dam it up and to start a business enterprise in the early 1790s. Now, he's helped along dramatically by the fact that he marries a very wealthy young woman, Captain Ring's daughter Elizabeth, and the father gives them a huge plot of land right across from the place where he's just purchased his, uh, his, his uh, potential mill site. So Montgomery, though, is important because he understands how valuable the waterway is. And within a few years' time, he's established a grist mill, a distillery, and eventually a wood pl planing mill as well. That gives him an opportunity to have not only his house, but a store and a tavern, all located on this crossroads uh, at the Oliverian Brook and Dartmouth College Highway. Okay. This is a wonderful um, uh, uh, painting from the New Hampshire Historical Society, which shows, let's see if I can use the laser pointer, yes. This would be the Montgomery's house here, and one of their um, uh, outbuildings. And here is what he started to create, right there on the Oliverian. Now, if you go by Route 10 and look for this, you will not see this. You will see a teeny little stream, um, uh, maybe a little wider on a good day. Um, but it is not uh, uh, the area that, uh, that would be familiar to Montgomery. Uh, I love this view of it. Again, this grist mill was still in use into the 1920s when it was run by Thomas Slight. It was finally taken out by, get this, a major flood in the Olivarian in, uh, in t late 27, I think, or 28. So, but this was what Montgomery saw. He envisioned this as an opportunity. And so this action becomes the catalyst for this whole story. The fact that he comes from Londonderry, he selects this site, he builds his house, he builds his store, and we have his first day book surviving from 1793, which provides a lens for introducing us to the people of the town. The day book in itself is an exciting discovery. The uh, General Montgomery's house has only been lived in by five families since it was built, um, which is incredible. And the fourth family, um, when they sold the house to the current owners, were cleaning things out, they found this day book stuffed in the rafters on the second floor of the shop. And this is the uh, pivotal piece that uh, John Page, who was then the president of the Historical Society, told me about. And it's just been, I've looked at it, I can't tell you how many times. Dane has looked at it with me, I don't even know how many times. Every time you look at it, you see something new. You see some new, some new reference, you see a new person, you see something that you didn't expect to see. Um, but as I say, we do have to draw a circle around this and finish this book at some point. So we need maybe to start writing and stop looking um, a little bit. But uh, the, so the day book was this crucial piece of information. And so using the day book in concert with census records, probate, land, tax, polling records, um, this very intricate uh, tapestry emerges. This microcosm of early American society 
Um, and I think that in many ways, as, as, uh, as Dane was saying, this becomes um, not in any town, but there are, we know there are many other towns that are similar to Haverhill throughout New England. We just happen to have some records for this one, right, that allow us to really flesh out the individuals. Now, Montgomery himself was known as a genial and generous host. We also know that he sent his three oldest daughters down to Boston to a very progressive female academy, Mrs. Rousens. Um, and it's not surprising that within a few years, he was actually known as the wealthiest man in town. He served his community and his country in several capacities. He was active in the War of 1812 when he was 48 and had a full household of children at home. He led his regiment, which included a number of Haverhill men, to protect the Portsmouth waterfront. Within short order, as I mentioned, his business acumen uh, really brought him to the attention of those who had been there for much longer. Um, but one of the things that we found out recently was that at the end of his life, in 1825, and, and the prosperity is where is where is all you hear about in the, the town histories. Uh, after the various financial panics of 1819 and moving forward, Montgomery died insolvent with creditors. A year before he died in 1825, he was trying to sell his property. And his second wife, Patience Cram, was interrogated somewhat vigorously by his executors about belongings that had, they felt had disappeared because they wanted everything back so they could collect money for his debts. Um, he's not the only one in town, of course, who went through that. He also had made very early um, forays into banking, which also was not uh, helpful in, in this particular case. But one of the things that I think uh, we were talking about Salem, uh, John was bringing up Salem and, and talking about um, the connections with the mills, one of the things that Montgomery does is he sets his house up on this rise, on this little hill, so he can see what's happening at his business down below. Just like Elias Haskett Derby in Salem or uh, the Sheaf family in Portsmouth could keep an eye on what was happening on their property. They lived very close to their business and activities. So he created this strong revenue service and uh, a revenue stream. Um, uh, and, and it's through this day book that he keeps. Now, he calls it day book number one, so we can assume that there were others that have not survived. But I feel incredibly fortunate that this one has. And so through this day book, we get this textured look at all the different townspeople who come into his shop. From the wealthiest, a supporter, to the poorest, Alden Sprague, who has to hire himself out for a few shillings a day to do uh, uh, raw jo odd jobs just to keep uh, things going, to the wealthy enslavers in the town and the enslaved, and to the widows, who rarely make an appearance in the store because there were still these gender hierarchies, sending somebody else instead to get them what they needed. So it's a fascinating look at this, micro, uh, of this entire town. Um, the other thing that is important about Haverhill is it was a court town. And so the circuit court was held there twice a year, in February and in May. And it went from a small town to a bustling town, where people like Daniel Webster tried many cases there. Uh, and it, suddenly all the houses and, uh, were turned into taverns and hostelries and uh, to accommodate people. So there was gossip, there were parties, there were ballrooms in many of the houses. And what did people talk about? They talked about the weather, and they talked about the crime, and they talked about you know, who was doing this to this, right? So all the gossip is taking place in this little town from all over. So you have this exciting feeling, and a lot of it was happening at Montgomery's house. He has this big house, he has a ballroom on the second floor, he's got lots of eligible daughters. And as we read through this book, we, uh, we find out that, um, well, first of all, there are 150 pages in this ledger. It covers 14 months' time. 
And in, in, my, uh, in the research that, that Dana and I have been doing with the book, one of the amazing things are finding just how important the seasonality was to this rural economy. So if you all remember that um, old English phrase, how does it go, Dane? Uh, half the corn must still remain by Candlemas Day, which is February 2nd or Groundhog Day. And, you know, we don't really think that much about it. Oh, isn't that cute? The groundhog sees a shadow. Well, this was really important because if you didn't have enough food by February to last you until the first crops came in, which, if you're lucky, was going to be late, you know, sometime in June or July, you were going to have a tough time. And the day book charts the when people were feeling, I've got a little money, I'm going to go to the store, I'm going to buy a little silk, I'm going to buy some West Indies rum, I'm going to buy a new suit, to I think I can buy a few nails, you know, or maybe a twist of tobacco. Um, which is what you find in the spring, right? Now, we found that some weather patterns uh, obviously are going to affect this, and so are holiday patterns. But all these things, once you know the context, you see them popping out in this, in this day book. So these parts of the sort of idea, for example, of national identity. Uh, after the town meeting, one of the townspeople buys everybody beer from the store, right? which would have been a major thing. And we can still understand the town meeting uh, idea. Um, the, the pastor who was installed, I'll do, I have to do this quick anecdote about, um, about uh, Montgomery himself, Brother Montgomery, and the congregational town. Because uh, we see Reverend Smith coming in and buying very modest items at the store, a comb a chamber pot. Um, he buys ink and paper, right? And he is installed in, as pastor in 1792. And his congregation, which was known as being rather wild, right? They had not really had an official church. People over in Vermont did. And they were supposed to share a pastor, but the I think the pastor didn't really like coming over to Newmarket, or to, sorry, not Newmarket, to Haverhill. Um, Maybe with Newmarket, too. I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, so uh, you have um, uh, Reverend Smith is installed. And at one point, even the general came under close scrutiny and had to appear before the congregation. And this is a quote from the church records. Brother John Montgomery sent in a confession to be read in public for his transgressions in writing on two occasions on the Lord's Day with a humble acknowledgment of his sin, which was accepted by the congregation and the pastor. So even if you were the richest man in town, you still didn't get away with riding on the Sabbath. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, I'm going to introduce a story for, uh, of Moody Bedell. Moody Bedell was, um, uh, for quite some time, very well respected in, his, in the town. But I first came across him in the day book as... I hate to say it, probably the town alcoholic. He shows up in the day book once, sometimes twice, once even three times buying alcohol. His house was very close to the shop. And he, depending on how much money he had, he was either buying New England rum, which was less expensive than West Indies rum. Sometimes he simply bought grog. Um, when he seemed to have money, he got brandy. Um, so I, w I kept seeing this name over and over again, and I thought, well, there's got to be more to Moody Bedell than this. And sure enough, there was. He came uh, from a very affluent family, and he made many land purchases. He, in fact, wa he was born in 1764, and he was noted um, by uh, one of the town historians as owning a tremendous amount of real estate um, throughout all different parts of, uh, of New Hampshire. But he started to put together a large plot of land uh, and assemble this. But he was called away for the War of 1812, and he wasn't paying attention. And when he came back, he, his grant was denied. And he was without any money, which was a source of tremendous embarrassment for him and shame. 
His wife died shortly thereafter. He had nothing to hand on to his children. And so you start to have a different feeling about what was happening for uh, Moody Bedell and his life. So if you'd just seen him in the day book but not had the context, um, you might not uh, put it all together, right? And then if you take a look where I have the green arrow, um, it says uh, Moody Bedell lent $3, um, or sorry, three pounds at this point. They were still in the 1790s uh, using old tenor, pounds, shillings, and pence. Um, it's not until, it's it, very, very regional in terms of how people are doing their uh, currency. At any rate, um, whether or not uh, General Montgomery lent him the money and expected it to be paid back or not, I don't know. There's no indication that it was paid back in what I've seen, but it may be tucked away there somewhere. So Montgomery also would broker deals between individuals for payment. You know, you see these funny things like so-and-so came in and paid for their bill with half of a fish and plums, right? The barter system was tremendous um, and is something that uh, I, I find fascinating. This is Moody Bedell's armchair, rocking chair. And it was given by his family to the Haverhill Historical Society. Um, and what I want you to see here is there are marks all over it. This is not a high-end chair. It has, whether he was whittling or doing something with a, a strap work, but a lot of repetitive motion. And again, you sort of think of perhaps this idea of isolation. Um, with his well-worn uh, armchair. And this is another part of where uh, Dane and I do our research. Um, this is the vault at the Haverhill Library, which was a bank. Um, and it's a great place to actually be able to do, to do research. Um, other things that show up in the day book, hours that people spent laboring in Montgomery's businesses. So here is his payment to someone who had worked for 35 days on the mill, is all it says. Now, this also predates this idea of, um, of the mill store, because what did the mill hands do after they finished and got paid? They went right over to Montgomery's store, and they bought rum, alcohol. Uh, they would buy uh, fabric, uh, books, whatever it is that they needed, because he had just about everything that you could possibly want. And remember, he has a distillery there as well. We found evidence of old growth hops over on the side of the distillery uh, with the current owner, which is very exciting. So you've got the house and the store, um, as well as the mills. And this was the whole sort of site. I'm going to just sort of skip through this. But um, a drawn out um, by John Page uh, shows just how large the holdings were for, for Montgomery. And the current owner has been just incredibly hospitable, has opened, they've opened their doors any time that we've uh, wanted to go and look. For example, just uh, right before the semester started, Dane and I paid them a visit just to sort of jump start and get connected back with our, our topic. Uh, so this is the house that I've been talking about. Very simple, uh, sort of Georgian on the outside, but it's absolutely gigantic gigantic on the inside. The scale of the steps, the scale of the rooms, um, uh, you would have known right away that this was the house of a wealthy individual. The parts of the original uh, kitchen with its set kettle are still in place. And then I'm going to conclude with uh, a look at the letters the, of Myra Montgomery. Uh, who was General Montgomery's third daughter. And um, one of the things, as we know, obviously, about history is you already know how it ends. So I, uh, I, I won't say a whole lot about how it ends, but you'll figure it all out, I'm sure. But when I first started this project, um, I was giving a tour to the Society of Architectural Historians of Hanover, uh, Orford, Lyme, and Haverhill. And we finished at the Montgomery House, which at that point was for sale. 
and it was, had nothing had been done to it since the Civil War. There was one bare light bulb hanging in the hall. But if you're a crazy architectural historian, that this was awesome because there was nothing that had been spoiled. You could see everything, right? So we had the reception there. And the real estate agent who was selling it said, oh, well, you must be into history. And I said, well, yes, I am. And she handed me a handful of letters that were Myra Montgomery's letters. They'd been ty transcribed, typescript, uh, probably in the early, I don't even know when, by a family member. Um, and as far as I know, they're the only copies that existed. So we made copies, and, they, and they're around. But, but so this very first experience with Myra was a very lucky happenstance for me. And if you're a researcher, you find that some things tend to come to you that you just don't expect. So the, the opportunity to, A, view the house, get the letters, hear about the day book, um, and then to actually meet somebody who, is, who had more letters is really serendipitous and makes you feel that you're doing a, <laughs> on the right path. So it's, although it's a very small section of letters, and the, um, the um, image I'm showing you there here may or may not actually be Myra, but it was definitely one of the Montgomery sisters. So I'm showing you this as sort of just to give some sort of a, 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 a image to uh, attach yourself to. And on the upstairs second floor, that is actually the room that she slept in and where she wrote many of her letters. And there's an example of her, her handwriting. Now Myra and her siblings also did a lot of graffiti in the back hall. And here, uh, just a few weeks ago, we were looking at their uh, graffiti for the house. There's the house and the shop um, and the whole landscape that the kids did. There are also some uh, animals and creatures and uh, all sorts of other images. So some things don't really change that much, right? There's also a pair of concealed shoes that was found in the attic, which um, I could talk to you about for a lot longer than anybody wants to hear about. Um, but Myra, as a, as a young teenager, uh, went to Boston when she was about 13 to study with Mrs. Rousing. Now, think about what it was like to go to Boston and then come back to Haverhill. And suddenly you're there and you're waiting probably for there to be the court days and the excitement and things like that. And she writes the most interesting and poignant letters, um, often very glib, somewhat sarcastic, many of them kind of goading of uh, her friend and probably ultimately fiance, Horace Henry Goodman, saying, please tell me, what is it that you prefer in the city to vegetating in the country, my dear Horace, right? So you get this sense of a woman who would like to be traveling and doing other things through her letters. And this is another view of her room. What I love about the letters, oh, here, okay. So uh, a quote from Myra from one of her letters to Horace. She says, if you've thought of me tonight, imagine me in my own snug bedchamber uh, with my writing implements before me and trying to decide if I should uh, begin a letter to you tonight. And then she says, and I didn't include that in the quote, she says, I've decided I will not. <laughs> she was quite something. Um, now, Myra, as I say, you, we've got this wonderful sort of uh, confluence of events that happen. Um, and Myra's in survival, her description of the house, really brings all these pieces together. You know, she could not have had the life that she had had, again, you know, you'd not ended up with Montgomery there at the Oliverian. She was able to um, have a life of relative privilege and luxury uh, in this remote North Country town. Um, and yet, there's some things that we can't get away from. And so one of the things that we find with this house is that this is a place where um, and I, I want to thank you all for letting us share this tonight, 
It's a house where people were born, lived and died, uh, where they loved, cooked, they cried, they wrote letters, and they sang, all in this very house. We know what rooms they carried out these activities. We know where they made their pies. We know how many pies Myra Montgomery made on one day, and the fact that she had to turn away a visitor who had outstayed his welcome by letting the fire go out, which was the only way you could get rid of somebody who was really, really comfortable in, in their seat, right? And she writes about this. Um, we know that Myra listened for her, uh, her fiance Horace's footsteps because she writes in a letter, I listened for the familiar sound of your footfall and the door latch in the back hall to announce your arrival. Um, and so when you have the house, the place, the letters, the people, the store, the neighborhood, it's just a, a, an incredibly powerful um, opportunity. We know where she wrote her letters on chilly December nights. We know where she and her family went sleigh riding. We know that after her mother died, she went for a sleigh ride, and when she came back, found the house to be morbidly empty. We know what she wore and ordered for the morning gown that she was going to wear for her mother's funeral. We feel her pangs of loss over, Myra's de over her mother's death, and her own realization just a year later that she would soon be following her because Myra died in 1817 at age 22 of consumption in the house where she was born, in the town where she was born uh, is where she died. And so I think you can look at any town and have these wonderful stories. This just happens to have a particular uh, uh, high level of, of survival rate and then some individuals who have a real thirst for understanding um, what happened uh, uh, in this town. And so um, as we've discussed, we need to pick up our pace on this one. And so, uh, you know, I think we'll be looking, I hope, at a 2025 or 26-ish. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, time for publication, but I want to thank you all for coming. And we've only told you, touched the surface, so we're happy to answer any questions. Um, Dane, do you want to come up here? Thank you, everybody, very much. So. Well, actually, you uh, right on the other side is Bradford, Vermont. So you've Bradford. <laughs> oh, do you want me to go all the way back to the map? Yeah. Um, so if you if you are in Hanover uh, near Dartmouth, and you continue along that side of the river, you have um, Lyme and Orford, and then Piermont and then Haverhill, and on the other side of the river you have uh, Bradford, Vermont, and. Fairly, Newberry, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is the the Connecticut, and then on the other side of the Connecticut is Vermont. So there, there was this shared ferry for a long time. Too. There's a there should be a detail, I think. Yeah, I need a question. Right. Well, generally, it was often tuberculosis, um, and they called it the, also called it the wasting disease. So she just um, stopped eating and drinking, and um, uh, the last letters are just very painful to, to, to read, actually. And she gets so weak she can't hold a pen, um, and she writes that her, uh, her gatekeepers, she's trying to write an end of a letter and she notes that my gatekeepers have left me. I've snatched up the pen so I could write you a line myself, Horace. And, um, uh, and then there's another letter from a sister saying, you know, if you don't come soon, Horace, she's not going to make it for Thanksgiving. So anyway, so it, it's really 
hard reading some of this material. And, the, and also the procedures, um, everything from leeches and uh, very strong uh, uh, um, emetics uh, to uh, go through her system, it, it, I can't, it would have been pretty terrible. We actually have some letters from her doctor, too, that uh, Christina Mistretta has recently found, although not dealing with her, but with a similar patient. Yeah, John. I'm sorry? Well, Horace is interesting. Thank you for asking. Um, Horace, uh, Horace was um, actually a young man in her, in Myra's father's regiment. She was about, t he was about 10 years older than Myra. And it, the genealogy is a little fuzzy. Some people say they were first cousins, but we haven't found that actually, we haven't found that out yet. And after she dies, um, as far as we've been able to tell, Horace never married. Um, so we don't know if he got there before she died, because we only have one-way letters, hers to him and her sister's to him, but we don't have anything going the other way. So that's, but who knows, maybe Christina Mistretta will find them. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, there there are a few very interesting um, accounts in Myra's letters about uh, odiferous stagecoach travel, with other people in the uh, carriage um, being somewhat unwashed, and how difficult. The travel was over the bumpy roads from Boston back up to uh, to uh, Concord and beyond. There also are some very interesting notations in Montgomery's um, day book, where he is actually takes his wagons, uh, sends wagons down with help to go to the markets at, to Haymarket in Boston with things from Haverhill, and it's fascinating reading. So he talks about how much he pays them. How, how much they pay to stay along the way, um, who's putting what in the back of his wagon, and he goes to, um, to Concord, and he also goes to Boston. So it tied in with the work that um, uh, Jim Garvin and Donna Bell Garvin did on the Portsmouth, it's really very interesting to think about the difference between road travel and then sleigh travel and then the river travel. Um, taking you in different directions. So, so having these accounts um, are, are quite interesting. Uh, Myra would travel uh, up to, was it Walpole or New Ipswich? Down, down to Walpole, uh, on the, quite a bit on the stage, um, as it turns out. But she was a big, she actually writes about making her own riding habit. She was a big, big into riding, even up, up until a few weeks before she died. <laughs> 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 
Well, thank you. That will, that will be just the, just the goading that we need to get it done. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Right. It was right at the junction of Route 10 and Dartmouth College Highway. So it's at the bottom of the hill. So if you come through Route 10 or if you're coming straight from Woodsville. So it's not in the it's not on the common, which is sort of it's down at the bottom of the hill. Yep. Yes. Yep. It, there you go. That's of course and you know that. Yes, exactly. Right? That's right. Yep. Yes. And you can still see some remnants. The, you, the, um, on the other side, the Ladd family had a tannery. And the Ladds and, and uh, the Montgomerys did a lot of business together. And, um, uh, and they were frequent, um, frequently in there. Their, their particular vice was uh, tobacco. So I can, <laughs> I feel like at the end of this, I can tell what everybody was very most interested in. <laughs> right. Well, it. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, actually, the first article I uh, wrote on Myra is in there. Um, Painting I showed was from New Hampshire Historical. They've got a number of letters. But the big breakthrough for our research from the New Hampshire Historical was that there were several letters of, of Myra Montgomery's that had been misfiled with another family member. And it wasn't until we started doing this research that we found them. So there were three letters. And in fact, one of the letters identified when the, um, the old school had burned down. Um, because Myra writes about the conflagration up at the common and that women were out there in their night clothes helping scoop water to get rid of the, the flames. And, um, and she also, one of her most outspoken passages in the letter, uh, says that um, the rising generation will be doomed to Gothic ignorance if people continue to burn down our uh, houses of education and our schools because another school had been burned down in Piermont just a few months before. So it was very interesting to find those letters. Yeah, that, I, I said I'd been working on it for a while. <laughs> But they do have they do have back issues. <laughs> they do. <laughs> can I answer? Can we answer any other questions? Great. And one, one final thing, uh, we did bring books. Um, if anybody wants to buy a book, all the proceeds will go to the Historical Society. So um, each, their, each 30 books, uh, $30 per book, we'll sign them, inscribe them, whatever, but all the money will go to the Historical Society programs. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hey, you know, we can charter a bus. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, the owner of the house would probably let us come, all come up. We had a great plan for brewing um, 
General Montgomery's ale with the hops that, that they found on the property. Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be fun? So who knows? We'll, we'll keep you posted on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>